I was muted. Hello, everybody. Howdy. Hi. Welcome. It is Wildlife Wednesday. What a great day for wildlife today. We are now currently streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. So say hello. Let us know what's up. I want to see those comments coming in. So I'm not just talking to a screen once again. My name is Ryan Godfrey. You may have seen me before on Wildlife Wednesday talking about plants, talking about butterflies, talking about, oh, what else did I talk about? Benthic macroinvertebrates. That was a good one. If you haven't seen those, then head back into our, our archive and check it out. We're over 20 episodes now of Wildlife Wednesday. Amazing. Amazing. So I am a botanist. means I study plants shrubs, trees, flowers, grasses, sedges even, and all of the wonderful um, insects and wildlife that interact with those plants. Because, you know, every animal needs a plant, but um, plants just like having animals around because they're cool like that. Um, so what's inspiring me these days? You know, I just heard a wonderful story about a little family of foxes that have taken up residence in um, a friend's backyard, and that's like their TV now. They just go out to the backyard and watch the foxes. I think that's pretty cool. I don't have foxes in my backyard. I just have a snowy balcony, but it's good enough. Um, so today, um, today our feature creature um, is one of Canada's most iconic species. And I have one, I actually have one here. Don't get too jealous, but this is my bank account right here. I've raided the piggy bank for um, a caribou. On our, on our shiny quarters. That's what we're talking about today. I don't know very much about caribou, but my colleague, Brandon, sure does. And that's who we've got here today, our species expert, Brandon, welcome. Thanks, Ryan. It's really, really great to be here with you. Wonderful. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you, Brandon? Where are you calling in from? For sure. So thanks everyone for, for joining. Uh, my name is Brandon. And I'm reaching you today from Montreal. I'm uh, a senior specialist on our resilient habitats team and uh, my work relates almost entirely to Arctic wildlife. So I've had the pleasure of uh, being here with you for Wildlife Wednesday in the past for Narwhal, which is actually our first Wildlife Wednesday ever. And then uh, more recently for polar bear, but I'm actually really excited to be here to talk to you about um, bear and ground caribou today. So uh, I've been working at WWF for uh, about six years now, time flies, but uh, uh, for a while I was living in Nunavut leading uh, this work and I recently moved to Montreal and that's where I'm uh, reaching you from today and looking forward to talking about caribou, especially the one uh, on your quarter there, Ryan. So cool. I love, you know, I've never been to the Arctic myself, not a whole lot of plants up there, but there are some. One day, one day I'll get a chance. But in the meantime, I'm living vicariously through you and your wonderful work. So why don't we just dive right into it? Tell us about caribou. What's the deal? Yeah, so not too many plants up there, like you said, but definitely some because there's caribou and caribou are uh, herbivores. So uh, today we're going to talk about caribou and uh, it's, it's a big word because it, it represents a lot of animals all in one. But today we're going to talk specifically about barren ground caribou, uh, which are caribou that we find uh, in the Canadian Arctic as well as uh, across uh, the circumpolar Arctic. They're a member of the deer family, so they look a lot like deer related to moose and elk and those kind of animals. But they're really unique caribou because uh, they're the only member of that family where both males and females have antlers. Antlers uh, are grown and, and fall off each year and they're actually made out of bone. So they grow right out of the skull of the animal and then they're grown and then they're, they're shed uh, at different times of the year if you're a male or if you're a female. Oh, wow, that's really cool. So it's almost like a deciduous tree, you know, grows, grows its leaves every year, sheds them. So that's basically caribou, you're telling me, are fleshy deciduous trees. I'm not sure I told you that, but for sure, we're, we'll go with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a lot of effort and uh, it's, uh, it's something that uh, they invest a lot of energy in each year. So it must be really important. And we'll talk about why uh, maybe a little later. But just to compare that, you know, some people get it confused with horns and uh, we think about rhinoceroses and animals like that that have horns, which are actually made out of the same thing your fingernails are made of, but these antlers are, are made out of bone. So cool. as we uh, as we said, they live out on the in the Arctic, so that's on the tundra. And you may think, well, what the heck's a caribou doing out there? What is it eating? And as Ryan alluded to, there are plants up in the Arctic, so they eat uh, plants like lichen, moss, and different Arctic grasses, like the sedges that that Ryan called out uh, earlier. 
And they have special adaptations. So they use their, use their hooves to uh, dig through the snow to access these uh, plants in the cold, dark winters. Uh, but during the summer months when it's exposed, they're able to just graze on uh, these small Arctic plants. And just lastly, uh, barren ground caribou, they're, they're not that big of an animal. Um, they look pretty impressive and big when you see them, especially because of their antlers, but they're actually only about four to five feet tall if you don't include their antlers. And they weigh around 200 to 300 pounds as adults. So not totally different from the weight of uh, humans. Okay. Oh, nifty. Well, Brandon, I'm learning so much already. Um, I, something comes to mind, my botanical mind, uh, thinking about, I, I've heard a term, um, reindeer moss, reindeer lichen, sometimes even caribou moss. Now, I've actually, I've come across this, this thing, <laughs> um, grows kind of all over the place. And I always assumed, okay, it must be named that because it's eaten by these creatures. Is that true? Is it an important food source? Yeah, so caribou lichen or caribou moss, as you put it, is, is definitely one of the main food sources. And it's found, uh, I think, across the whole Canadian Arctic. Uh, I've seen it before. And I remember the first time I saw it, I thought, uh, is this named because it looks like antlers? Because it's got this really branched out, beautiful pattern to it. Um, but uh, it's, it's probably named, like you said, for actually because it's uh, eaten around the circumpolar Arctic in different forms by, by caribou and, and reindeer, which we'll get into in a minute as to why we're keeping using those two terms uh, interchangeably. But you know, I've always been um, a wildlife biologist and I'm notoriously bad with plants. And uh, to be completely honest, I, I could use a refresher, I think, on the difference between mosses and lichens. So I, I'm pretty lucky to have a botanist on the call. Okay, okay, okay. Let's get into it for a minute here. So, so giving you a one minute limit here, botanist, on okay, uh, okay. going through mosses and lichens. We can do that. Okay, so, so reindeer moss, caribou, lichen, whatever you want to call it. The scientific name is Cladonia rangiferina. So rangifer is a, it's the same. That's from the scientific name for, for caribou, right? So that's kind of a, a neat thing to notice right away. And it is, in fact, a lichen. And a lichen is neither a moss nor a plant. It's actually a symbiotic um, entity. So it, it comprises both fungi and, uh, and algae sort of working together to form a an organism that is more than the sum of its parts. And what's really cool is they can live in places that neither of those organisms would be able to live by themselves and often very extreme conditions like the Canadian Arctic. Pretty cool. Seems like a pretty tough existence for a, a creature that just gets eaten by a uh, reindeer. But uh, yeah, I'm really happy they exist because they give us the creatures like, uh, like reindeer who are, are a really big important species in the Arctic. So that's, that's really cool. Indeed, indeed. Okay, so with that, um, Let's go right into our species deep dive, um, where in which I shall be asking you very many questions, lots of questions, Brandon. I'm ready. The first of which, let's talk about this naming issue. Reindeer versus caribou, are they the same? Are they different? What's going on? It's a great question to, to start off with, and it's especially relevant uh, every December when the, the issue of, of reindeer and caribou comes up more than ever. Uh, so caribou, uh, and reindeer across the whole planet, uh, whatever you've heard to being referred to as a caribou or a reindeer, it's actually the exact same species, uh, Rangifer terrandus, as uh, Ryan alluded to with that Rangifer. Um, and basically, you can think of them, all the different animals that I'm going to talk about today, whether it's a barren ground caribou or others, are, are subspecies. And uh, for conservation purposes, that's what we refer to. For this type of animal, we refer to the subspecies. It's kind of a little like thinking about how every single uh, domestic dog in the world is the same species. So if you have anything from a Chihuahua to a St. Bernard, it's the same Latin name for that animal. Um, but when we break it down, uh, obviously there are differences there. And not to say that the caribou uh, and reindeer differ as much as a Chihuahua and a St. Bernard, but there are some interesting differences between the subspecies that uh, we can get into more. So some examples, we're going to talk about barren ground caribou today, so we'll kind of leave that and come back to it. But you also may have heard of woodland caribou, which are more emblematic, and you see them on the quarter, and uh, they live in the forest parts of Canada. But there's also reindeer that live in uh, Scandinavia, so in Finland, Norway, Sweden, uh, that part of the of the world, and they're actually uh, semi-domesticated and sometimes fully domesticated in those parts of the world, so they're uh, a little bit different. And then there's even the example of the uh, the smallest reindeer caribou in the world, which are super cute, which are uh, Svalbard reindeer, which live in the far, far north islands of, of Norway. Um, 
and uh, they, they look very different from the caribou that we're going to talk about today. So there's a bit of diversity, but at the end of the day, caribou, reindeer, same species. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much for finally clarifying that. And <laughs> henceforth in this discussion, we'll be calling them caribou. Okay. All right. right? Yeah. Good. I might switch. Um, I might. I might mix it up. But I'm going to try. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now uh, you you alluded to, and I'd love a little bit more detail on this distinction between the barren ground versus the woodland caribou. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, for sure. So. Uh, the main difference is, is right there in their name. So woodland caribou live in the woods and they're found uh, primarily in the boreal forest right across the country. And they're actually found in every province in Canada, except for New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and, and Prince Edward Island. Uh, they tend to be bigger. They tend to have uh, bigger uh, antlers or, or racks as we refer to them. Uh, they tend to be uh, a little darker in color and in general, just a little more stately compared to uh, my favorite caribou, which are the barren ground caribou, which tend to look a little more rough around the edges, I think, when you when you see them. But there's a good reason for that. Um, just as we see in their name, barren ground caribou, they live on the tundra, which is also referred to as the barren lands. And not a very attractive name, but uh, the lands are quite barren in where they live. They live above the tree line, so they tend to not exist really in the same places where, where trees are. The other uh, really major difference is uh, kind of how they act. Uh, barren ground caribou get together in big herds, sometimes in the hundreds of thousands of individuals, sometimes smaller in a couple of thousands. And woodland caribou uh, tend to group together in smaller groups, uh, a lot smaller numbers than, than when and the uh, barren ground caribou. And lastly, the, the main big difference I'd say is uh, kind of explains the, the rougher image of a barren ground caribou is they lead a bit of a tougher life because they migrate thousands of kilometers every year uh, to get from their calving grounds to their wintering grounds. Uh, whereas woodland caribou tend to move around in a smaller habitat. There's a lot of diversity around woodland caribou movement, but barren ground caribou are known for their huge migrations um, across the tundra. And you see here, these uh, beautiful images of barren ground caribou migration and some small plants you get a bit of uh, some sedge action and some mosses that you see here uh, at the beginning or maybe the end of winter as the uh, starts to be available here we see uh, what looks like potentially moving across a frozen lake uh, right at the tree lines maybe uh, caribou arriving and then here you see caribou uh, that are probably starting their migration uh, with their newborn baby calves. You see a few there and then a picture here of caribou arriving and, and giving birth and thriving on their calving grounds. Wow, amazing. Love that footage. So many of them. Okay, and that makes me think about populations, population size. So I've got a, I've got a three-part question for you here. I hope that's okay. We'll do it one at a time. First of all, um, just how many? What is the population size of these caribou in Canada? It, you, you can imagine it fluctuates a lot. You know, we're talking about kind of big numbers of animals, but the best estimate I'd say right now is we have 800,000 barren ground caribou in Canada. And you may be thinking, oh good, thank God, a conservation story with uh, 800,000 individuals, how can that be bad? Unfortunately, <laughs> barren ground caribou are one of the biggest conservation concerns in the country right now. And that's because uh, even though we have so many in terms of a number, uh, they're actually divided across individual herds. And some herds are doing terribly, and it's only really a few herds that are doing well and are kind of buoying that number up. In fact, not too long ago, uh, the global estimation of barren ground caribou, because they are found uh, in small variants in Russia and Greenland as well, was around 4.7 million animals just a few decades ago. And today, if you add up all the barren ground caribou across the world, that's only 2 million, 2.1 million. So a decline of, of more than 50%. Hmm. That's a really good point to remember that it's not always just about the sheer numbers, it's about how things are changing. And sometimes that can be over space, over time. So good, good to remind us all of that. Now, uh, speaking of groups, you know, often animals have really fun sort of group names. So I'm wondering, is there a cool name for what a group of caribou is called? I think we're just stuck with herd on this one. So uh, it's a pretty cool word, but I don't think it has the same uh, gravitas as a, a murder of crows or, or something like that. But they're called uh, herds. And uh, it's really the, the defining feature of barren ground caribou is their herding uh, behavior and how they group together in the hundreds of thousands sometimes, like I said. Um, we have uh, 12 of these herds in Canada, roughly. Um, 
they vary all the way from in the far west. We have the porcupine herd, which is a couple hundred thousand individuals and doing really strong. And they actually migrate between Alaska and uh, Yukon. And then we also have uh, on the far east, we have the Baffin Island herd, a herd that uh, used to have a couple hundred thousand individuals and now is down to only 5,000 individuals. So you see where you get these inequalities in terms of the conservation status of the herds. That's why it's not really the best idea just to take the 800,000. I think everything's okay. We really do have many herds that are uh, in dire straits right now. Got it. Got it. Okay. So that's really cool that the, the herds are so huge and named and stuff too, though. By the way, if anyone would like to submit um, for consideration another name, a cooler name than herd, we'll, we'll hear it. Just put it in the comments, you know, we'll, we'll read it out for you even if you come up with a cool one. Okay. Now, so finally, we've got these big groups. Sometimes they're named. Do we have an idea of how many of these groups there are in total in Canada? Yeah, so from across the coast to coast uh, on the mainland, from the islands of the archipelago to uh, to to the Yukon, we have around around twelve herds, um, and they really do vary in their conservation status. But like I said, the, the majority of them, the vast majority of them, are not doing well at all. Uh, one other example I'll give you is the the Bathurst herd, which is a herd that calves in the western part of, of Nunavut, but spends the majority of its year down in the Northwest Territories. And if you can imagine, back in the uh, late 80s, this herd had 472,000 individuals, a huge amount of, of animals, just uh, almost unimaginable how many animals that is. And then you'd be surprised probably to hear today if I told you that in 2018 or 19, the last time we had a good number, we only have 8,000 of those animals left. So that is a 98% decline in the population of that herd. Um, so it's really important why we're working on this animal from a conservation perspective, not only uh, to help recover these herds, but give them a fighting chance in that recovery as well, because they do fluctuate normally. We do have herds that go up and go down with time and uh, tr uh, local knowledge and Inuit knowledge and indigenous knowledge tells us this. There's been periods of scarcity with caribou and periods of uh, big numbers. But the difference we need to think about right now is not, there are so many herds that are having trouble at the exact same time, as well as the fact that the last time these populations were in dire straits was in the, probably the 1950s. And if you think about comparing 2020 and the 1950, the world is a completely different place in terms of the uh, amount of pressure that are on these caribou from a, a climate warming perspective, from an industrial development perspective, and also just from the amount of infrastructure that's in the north that kind of limits their successful chance of recovery. So that's why we're working to try and foster that recovery got it yeah wow 98 percent. that's that's not uh that's not just a, a chance a little fluctuation there that is what we like to call a catastrophe right there amazing yeah yeah blows so, our living planet index out of the water yeah geez <laughs> i can see why we're spending so much time and attention on them um so I, you mentioned um, indigenous folks uh, just a moment ago. I'm I'm curious. Could you tell me a little bit more about the significance and the sort of interaction about uh, between these these creatures and um, the indigenous populations in Canada's north? Sure. Yeah. So it's it's not just barren ground caribou, but caribou across uh, the country are important for indigenous groups across the country. I'll speak a little bit about the, the northern context, just given that we're talking about barren ground caribou. Um, but people have relied upon uh, caribou for time immemorial and have uh, followed the caribou and lived among the caribou. And there are a lot of groups uh, in the Northwest Territories and Inuit who consider themselves to be caribou people because of the close, close ties between the culture and these animals. Um, caribou are, have, have been and remain an important source of food for people. It's not only healthy, but culturally appropriate and, and traditional. Um, they're also used for clothing. Caribou fur is one of the warmest furs, so uh, it's been used a lot in the past and continues to be used today in, in, uh, in traditional ways. Um, and there are many people in Nunavut who depend on caribou and who are very interested in the conservation of these herds. And they, they know from uh, Inuit knowledge and from uh, indigenous knowledge that there are times of scarcity like we have now, but they also know that we need to do take action at this time to make sure that, that caribou come back. And, and luckily, one of the things we have to do, and we're working with our Inuit partners on this, is, is do nothing. We have to give them time. We have to give them space. And that involves taking those areas where they calve, where they're very, very sensitive, and ensuring that they're just given space and quietness to give birth to and raise their calves. Because they're very skittish during this time. They're very uh, nutritionally stressed. And they migrate to these areas to... Uh, uh, very much on purpose to be in these very specific areas. So one thing we're really working on is trying to work closely with our Indigenous partners. And in Nunavut, that means our Inuit partners, 
and to protect these areas, these calving grounds. Got it. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for that context. That's uh, this is really amazing. I love. I always love hearing about the work that's going on. You know, I I don't get to do all of the, all of these things, but it's it's just inspiring. The, all the things that we're doing. Amazing. We should bring you on as a, a lichen and, and moss conservation biologist in the north. Maybe it might help. Hey, if I get an invite, I am not <laughs> going to turn that down. <laughs> okay. I want to talk a little bit more about the the migration. You talked about these really um, intense long impressive migrations so um how far are these migrations where are they coming from where are they going for what purpose yeah and i'm going to try to sell you on why barren ground caribou are one of the most amazing animals in the world and that's because they are an actual record holder they are the longest or they hold the record for the longest migration of any land animal in the world any land mammal uh, so the only animals that actually migrate further than barren ground caribou are birds and whales who uh, do have longer migratory distances but um, for a land mammal so uh, sometimes we think you know maybe wildebeest or antelope have these giant migrations across the serengeti but we do have the, the record holders right here at home in Canada. And the, the herd with the, the longest distance to go is, is the porcupine herd, which lives over in the western part of Canada, northern Canada and in Alaska, like I said. And they actually migrate uh, between the uh, calving grounds further north, right on the coast uh, of, the, of the Arctic Ocean. Um, down in here we see actually we can see it here so we have spring we have calving period and we have these calves all together and then we'll see them soon start migrating south for the fall and the winter where it's a little bit better conditions and then if we can play this again we see them in the winter and then we see them all just whoop going up together and that's where they're going to have their young together uh before they spread out to raise their young a little bit before going back down for the fall so amazing a bit of a quick animation, but the distance, uh, the straight line distance between uh, the calving grounds further north and the wintering grounds further south is uh, 640 kilometers. And they do that back and forth every year. And uh, basically, if you want to put that in context, it's like walking from Montreal to Toronto every year. It's actually a little bit longer than that. Or for our, for our friends out west, it's like walking from Saskatoon to Calgary and back every wow. year. And uh, you can imagine that these caribou don't take straight lines. So there's a lot of things in their way and a lot of uh, meandering, as you can imagine caribou do. And sometimes individuals walk thousands of kilometers. So it's, it's really impressive, but 640 kilometers in general between where they calve and where they spend the winter. That's amazing. Wow. I've, you know, I'm never going to look at a quarter the same way again. I've learned so much. <laughs> but they're, um, the, they're the non-migratory ones, so they don't get uh, as much. Uh, okay. That's why they look so beautiful, because they don't Got have it. to walk 640 kilometers twice a year. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Okay. Now, I'm not the only one with questions here. We got some other questions coming in from our viewers. So let's, let's check out um, the first one that came in. We've got a little video. My name's Zidane, I'm going to be six years old, and I want to know, do caribou's hibernate? Zidane, great Love question, question Zidane. I don't know if you're named after Zidane Zidane, but if you are, that's awesome. Uh, caribou uh, do not hibernate. They're barren ground caribou, or, or any caribou, or reindeer around the world, rather, don't hibernate. But it's a really good question. You might think that because they live so far north, it's so cold. Uh, maybe it'd be a better life strategy just to hunker down and kind of go to bed for a while and, and wait out the harsh winters. But in, in reality, caribou, uh, the way that they've adapted to uh, living in the north is to be constantly on the move constantly in search of food, constantly in search of safe haven, uh, whether that be uh, in the winter or to conditions that are a little for, uh, easier for them or whether it's to migrate north to the safety and calmness of their calving ground. So they don't migrate, they're always on the move and it kind of explains kind of why they uh, lead such a tough life. Makes sense. You know, I just went for a cold weather run and that really warmed me up. So I don't feel like I need to hibernate either. <laughs> <laughs> We've got, we've got one more question coming in from Kaylee. Let's see that question. Is it true that like only males have antlers? And if so, like why? Yeah, good question. And you're right for 99% of the deer family, but uh, for caribou, uh, they're the only member of that family that the males and females both have uh, antlers. Um, and the reason why, of course, they have antlers is if you're a male, it's to uh, compete with other males when it's time for mating season and time to uh, get ready to, to 
create the calves. And if you're a female, you have uh, some small antlers as well because barren ground caribou live on the barren lands and uh, the best patches of lichen are hard to come by. And you, if you're a female, you want to have a bit of a rationale as to why you get to have the best access to lichen and moss. So they do a little bit of fighting themselves for territory as they're moving around. So that's why we have uh, antlers on, on both. But the antlers on females are, are quite a bit smaller than the antlers on the males. Got it, got it. Okay, I'm taking a look right now at the chat. There's still time if you have questions, get in, get them in, get them in so we can answer them. But um, what I'm seeing right now is a question from Tasha from Facebook. And Tasha noticed um, in one of the figures that there's lots and lots of females. And is that normal for this type of species? Yeah, it's a great question and great. Uh picking that out uh, from, from far away with uh, the footage we had. Uh, they tend to migrate uh, in different gendered groups. Uh, sometimes, depending on the age, you might have a mix of gender, but they tend to have slightly different uh, timings and, and pathways that they migrate. So the footage you saw, uh, the one that you're referring to, is probably mostly females, maybe some young males. Maybe there were some females that look like males or some males that look like females, depending on their, the size of their antlers. But uh, they do tend to separate out into, uh, into their genders when they're migrating. So it's not abnormal to see a big group of uh, females migrating together. And when I say like when there's 400,000 animals, they're not migrating as one. They kind of take their time, as you saw with that porcupine uh, uh, animation. And, but they're generally all going in the same direction at the same time. Okay. Okay. Got it. Looking at some more questions. Um, I see Tina has asked a question about what's in my, my hair. It's a little swallowtail <laughs> butterfly. Check out the swallowtail butterfly episode from earlier on in the feed. It's because my hair is getting long in the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but okay, so maybe with that, given our time, I see one um, more question I just want to take real quickly, hey. if you don't mind, Ryan, and it's from yeah. my niece. So I have to shout out to my niece, Brooklyn, who's asking me if, uh, if caribou if it hurts when they lose their antlers and that's a, a great question um, and I, I think you got to ask a caribou that uh, be able to be able to know that I, I'll say that I would not want to be the animal that grows big bones out of my head and every year and have to shed them um, but I will say that it, they're probably really adapted to it they do it every year and uh, it's a process that they're used to but it's a really good question and one that you know uh, we need to ask the caribou directly to know if it hurts there you go. Yeah, we'll never be able to know exactly what it is to be a caribou. I'm just thinking back to the deciduous tree thing. And I know that when deciduous trees lose their leaves, they actually sort of have some programmed cell death. So some of those cells die and then and then you can actually just sort of knock the leaf down and it doesn't really mean anything. It's kind of like, I don't know, clipping your fingernails or something like that. Not sure if that's what's going on with the caribou, but um, once again, animals and plants are different. <laughs> so <laughs> They don't seem too stressed when they're doing it. So I think they're okay. pretty okay. That's good to know. Good, good. So with that, why don't we go on to the probably most exciting part of Wildlife Wednesday, I think, which is the trivia. This yeah. is the point where we get to quiz you, see if you are paying attention, and we will just jump right into our trivia. Okay, the first question. How many kilometers does the porcupine herd migrate each year between their wintering grounds further south and the calving grounds further north? All right, so if you remember, it's roughly like walking from Montreal to Toronto, or it's like walking from Saskatoon to Calgary. It's a pretty long distance, and it's uh, that animation we saw of the caribou in the far west migrating from the Arctic Ocean down to their wintering grounds. Let's see. Oh, we've got we've got a guess from Bruce. Bruce guessed 650. Hmm. Uh, interesting. Quite, Doreen, 640. Fine. Price two. is right rules here, so you can't be over. At 640, <laughs> Doreen was bang on. Wendy, you came in at the last minute. You got it. You got it. Wonderful. So distance between Toronto and Montreal. That's that's how far we are apart right now. <laughs> I, true. I'm not particularly eager to make that journey at the moment, Brandon. <laughs> and they're doing it in temperatures <laughs> like this and a lot colder than this. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Next question. 
which country has the honor of having the smallest subspecies of caribou slash reindeer in the world? All right, I thought this maybe would be a bit tricky because I just kind of threw it in there as a throwaway comment, but uh, they are the cutest caribou slash reindeer that I have ever uh, seen. Well, I've never had the uh, pleasure of seeing them in the wild because they live in a pretty remote location. But uh, which country? We have caribou and, and reindeer in Russia and Finland and Norway and Greenland and Canada in the United States in terms of Alaska. Hmm. Which of those countries oh, have this smallest? Here we go. Clément says, is guessing Norway. Wendy guesses Norway. Catherine guesses Norway. Svalbard. Catherine. Wow. Specific and correct. Ashley got it too. Islands above Norway. Exactly. Nice. Nice. You see a calf there and an adult. They're kind of stubby little things, but they're, they're, they're the same species as everything we've talked about today. Adorable. Everyone loves a miniature. Okay. Next question coming up. What are the only three provinces or territories in Canada that do not have any caribou? And this doesn't count. The ones on the coins don't count. We're talking about the live caribou. And we're talking about all the caribou in Canada. So we didn't really get to it, but there are mountain caribou too in Canada. But we're talking about woodland caribou, mountain caribou, barren ground caribou. They're spread across the whole country. Um, but there's three provinces where we don't, or territories, but maybe I gave you a hint. They're actually all provinces where we don't have any caribou. All right. Okay. We've got Gabrielle is guessing. You can PEI guess one, there's two. Uh, Laurence guesses PEI, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. The answer, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island. There we go. Yeah, it'd be pretty tough to get out to PEI, but if anyone can do it, I feel like it's a caribou. They walk yeah. along the Confederation Bridge, it'd be nothing for them. Yeah, that'd be an easy task. I got it all figured out. <laughs> caribou are right. good swimmers too, so uh, huh? maybe they'll make it one day. Next question, what are some steps that we can take to help caribou recover? All right, so we're talking about barren ground caribou specifically here. Um, so what are some steps we could take? Uh, you might want to think about the area where they're sensitive. You might want to think about um, some changes that are going on in their habitat that we can try to regulate. Um, you might want to think about who we should be working with when we work on caribou conservation. These are all things we're trying to do as WWF Canada and that we're doing with our, with our partners. Mm hmm. This one's got them stumped, Brandon. I'm not seeing mm. anything funny. They're, everyone's really just, they're thinking hard. The answer is protect calving grounds, work directly with indigenous communities, limit disturbance from industrial development, and get climate change in check. There you go. Lots of different things. Hey, Catherine said protecting calving grounds. That's great. Wonderful. There we go. Leave them alone. Wendy May, give them space during calving season. I remember you talked about that, Brandon. That. So, Wendy, definite points for that. Good job. So that was our last question, Brandon. That's oh, the too end bad. Of that was yeah. yeah. And and that actually brings us to the end of this Wildlife Wednesday episode. So thank you to everybody who who tuned in. It was a pleasure, marvelous time. Loved it. And don't forget that um, this happens periodically. In fact, it happens the last Wednesday of every month. So we'll be back next month for another episode. Mystery um, <laughs> surprise topic. So and if you if you actually if you have a suggestion, if you have a species or topic that you'd like to be covered, let us know. You can put it in the comments and we do check that. And, you know, we're always looking for new topics. So with that... Um, I would like to bid everyone adieu, farewell. Thanks again for coming, and thanks to you, Brandon. That was that was wonderful. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everyone. That was great. Good job on the trivia. That was a lot of fun.